His name sometimes appears in surprising places, places like uh, quiz shows, crossword puzzles. For $2,000, name a composer, a German composer, who had 20 children. No prompting for the house, please. Second letter A, third letter C. Four letters in all, Bach. Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, who never traveled outside his native Germany and who would be amazed by his international fame today and bewildered by the extent of his wealth from records and performing rights. A monument to human achievement, a yardstick by which greatness is judged. What does the word composer suggest to us? An emaciated man in a garret destined for an early death whose genius is ill-considered by his contemporaries? A shaggy exhibitionist hammering the pianoforte in a Paris salon among swooning ladies of high society? Or perhaps a bearded man pushing the buttons of a synthesizer? Well, none of these images would apply to Bach, nor could they apply to the Germany of 300 years ago. It was a land of princelings and grand duchies, not at all the cohesive country of today. The fabric of society was simple. There were those who ruled, and those who served. And there was no room in it for the composer per se, but merely for the musician, who was expected to do everything, even to write music, when he was not seated at the organ, leading a choir, or beating time for a chamber orchestra.
The Bach violin is not as powerful or as brilliant as those we hear in the concert halls today. There's less tension between the strings, the bow is more flexible, the sound is softer. And incidentally, in Bach's day, there were no conductors in the contemporary sense of the word. No one had ever heard of transmitting interpretive ideas. The conductor's sole duty was to keep the correct time, and he did so while playing the violin or the cembalo, or otherwise standing behind the organ waving a rolled up sheet of paper. They even banged the ground with a pole. Lully, the French composer of Italian origin, died that way. He missed the floor and hit his foot, didn't look after it, gangrene set in. It's a strange way for a conductor to die. Sometimes they're killed by critics, but not by poles. The orchestras, of course, were quite small, and besides, those aristocratic patrons with their strict sense of hierarchy would not have tolerated looking at anyone's back least of all, the back of their humble court musician. Bach was not an aristocrat, of course, but he did belong to a dynasty, a dynasty of musicians. His family tree can be traced back to the 16th century. His great-great-grandfather, Feit, was a miller and an accomplished uh, sitar player. His son, a carpet weaver, enjoyed a reputation as a violinist. From then on, the family produced professional musicians by the dozen, scores of them, trumpet players, town musicians, organists, cantors and the like, holding important positions all over Germany for two centuries. The family symbolized the idea of music, so much so that in some regions people didn't say a musician, but simply a Bach. They were a very traditional family of devout Lutherans who clung to their roots in the forests of Thuringia. They were quite aware of their special gifts and naturally every new addition to the family played an instrument as soon as he could hold it. Johann Sebastian Bach was a highly accomplished keyboard player, and he was one of the first to make use of the thumb. I mean, can you imagine playing the piano or the cembalo with only four fingers, even a scale? No. Oh. <laughs> no. The thumb was only used at that time when absolutely necessary in an emergency. Well, Bach devised a technique by which all five fingers were to be completely equal in strength and agility. They say he played with such ease you could hardly see his fingers move. Let's see if Israela Margalit can do it.
That was the virtuoso Bach, full of energy, brilliance, and rhythmic joy. Another side of Bach is intimate and contemplative. There was a great deal of sadness in his life. He lost his mother when he was nine. His father died about a year later. His first wife died at an early age. And about half of his offspring did not survive childhood. His deep religious belief and strong character must have helped him overcome these experiences, uh, which, however tragic, were fairly commonplace at the time. But there is no sign of Bach ever losing hope or courage. But in much of his music, we find an expression of universal sorrow. It's never more tangible than in his solo works uh, for the violin and for the cello, a musical form uh, which is quite rare. His chacon for violin solo haunted musicians for generations. Brahms described it as a world of deepest reflection and violent emotion, all for one small instrument. And his works for solo cello became a challenge to every performer, from Casals and Rostropovich to Misha Maisky. for our time too, a lonely voice 
in an overcrowded wilderness. Bach had no chance to be a lonely child, however. He was born on March the 21st, 1685 in Eisenach in Eastern Germany, the youngest of a family of eight children. Educated by his uh, town musician father, Bach was surrounded by the family clan, a close-knit group of which all the male members assembled every year in a huge reunion devoted to singing and in the intermissions to a warm exchange of experience and knowledge. of his parents closed this happy chapter of Bach's life all too soon. At the age of 10, Johann Sebastian moved into the house of his older brother. Life was not easy. Money was scarce. Bach studied music, attended the Latin school, and helped the family finances by singing. He had apparently a lovely soprano voice, which eventually won him a scholarship to a good school in Lüneburg. Uh, he was 15 at the time. He learned Greek, Latin, theology, perfected his mastery of string and keyboard instruments, became a prodigious performer on the organ. He was a member of the school choir, and he earned a penny every time he sang at a wedding or a funeral. Soon those lovely high notes were replaced by the deep voice of a self-possessed young man. Smoking his precocious pipe and armed with his phenomenal virtuosity, Bach went about the usual business of finding a job. was a small town which had a splendid organ. 
And Bach's playing impressed the consistory greatly. What mastery of facility. At the age of 18, Bach secured his first important position. Over the years, Bach's organ playing became legendary. Later on, he held a position as organist, first in Mühlhausen, then at the prestigious court of Weimar. It was said that he could do with his feet alone what other organists could not do with their feet and fingers put together. He wrote a vast number of masterpieces for the organ, of which the Toccata and Fugue in D minor is perhaps the most widely loved. Still a young bachelor and full of new ideas, Bach returned to Arnstadt after four months' absence, only to face a different kind of music. Why had he stayed away three months longer than permitted? Why were the organ preludes so excessively long? And after that, why were the organ preludes now too short? Moreover, there was a rumor that he had gone to an inn during a Sunday morning sermon, and he allowed a woman to practice singing in a church on consecrated ground. Oh, he ignored the accusations. This was vintage Bach. Rather than striving to defend himself, he simply lost interest in the case. He began looking for a position elsewhere. The final gesture of defiance was to marry the very woman he had allowed to sing in church his cousin, Maria Barbara. They lived happily, and she bore him seven children before her untimely death 13 years later. A year and a half after that, Bach married the beautiful young Anna Magdalena, who remained at his side for the rest of his life. Bach's family life was indeed happy and harmonious. Anna Magdalena gave birth to 13 children. She was a devoted wife. And at the end of a hard day's work, she would join Bach in copying music. He was deeply devoted to his wife and children. The family was the backbone of his existence, and his music was his way of life. It was a form of worship. As Bach might have said, to God alone the glory.
In today's world, a musician who can do one thing well is considered highly skilled. In Bach's time, such a specialist would have had difficulty finding employment. The number of Bach's activities was simply incredible, even by the standards of his day. He wrote a vast amount of music of every kind. At one time, he was composing at the rate of a cantata a week. He transcribed his own music and that of other composers. He traveled extensively in Germany, designing and testing organs. He led orchestras and choirs. He taught many students beside members of his family. He mastered all the keyboard instruments. Bach loved the singing quality of the violin. He was a master of the, of the long line, no doubt influenced by the Italians who had melody in their blood. Bach then developed a special technique on the keyboard, trying to achieve a similar effect of vibration and continuity of the note. However, the instruments at his disposal could hardly satisfy his vision of legato sustained playing. The harpsichord provides for a variety of registers and has a dry, detached sound. It's an aristocratic instrument, frequently used at that time, but uh, it was not Bach's favorite. Bach was quite attached to the clavichord, however, with its mellower and softer sound. The pianoforte was in the very early stages of its development. Bach took a vivid interest and made some important suggestions. How pleased he would have been with our modern piano, with its variety of tone, its power, its precision. music, it's difficult to realize how belligerent Bach could sometimes be. When opposed, he would either lose his temper, ignore the instructions of his superiors, or go absent without leave. 
And Leipzig was the worst of all the places he had been. The city fathers had tried first to interest the celebrated Telemann in the post of Cantor. Uh, he turned them down. Quite a few others, less famous, also refused the appointment until they worked their way down to Bach. Almost immediately, he took a poor view of his new job. I find that the appointment here is not really as considerable as I was led to understand. It has been deprived of many perquisites. The town is very expensive. The authorities are strange people with little devotion to music, so that I have to endure almost constant vexation, envy, and persecution. The city council was of a different opinion. Not only does the cantor do nothing, but he will not give a satisfactory explanation for doing nothing. He is simply incorrigible. Both were probably right, to some extent. The state of music at St. Thomas' School in Leipzig, where he taught, was most unsatisfactory. The stingy council had little inclination to improve matters. On the other hand, Bach certainly did neglect many of his duties with a disobedience that stunned his orderly superiors. And yet, St. Thomas's Church became a place of pilgrimage for music lovers for generations to come. <laughs> The last years of Bach's life were marked by continued fame and increasing rejection. Though he continued to enjoy universal praise as an organist, his music was out of fashion. The Rococo, with its pleasant light-heartedness, its grace, its elegance, was now in vogue. Even Bach's eldest sons had no real understanding of their father's music. Bach took pride in their success, of course, which was even greater than his own. But their creative worlds were far apart. Bach's eyesight failed. The succeeding operations only aggravated his state. It was at this stage that Bach composed his purest, most abstract work, The Art of Fugue, one of the last great examples of polyphonic music. This was his final statement. He didn't live to complete the work. In July of 1750, Bach died of a second stroke at the age of 65. After his death, his family scattered. Anna Magdalena died nine years after him in abject poverty. She was not helped by her children. The family tradition of mutual assistance had gone forever. Some of his sons became rich and famous in their time. The music of the Berlin Bach, Carl Philipp Emanuel, and of the London Bach, uh, Johann Christian, uh, was popular, was highly praised. But today, when the name of Bach is mentioned, we mean the one and only aging, blind Johann Sebastian. <laughs> 